from Hollywood, welcome to Starlight Mystery Theater and another episode in the series, Matthew Slade, Private Investigator. We invite you to take your seat as Slade unfolds Passage to Tangier. My job, the hours are odd. So are the circumstances and the people I meet. You could even call some of them dangerous. My calling card reads, Matthew Slade, private investigator. Ancient history peers over your 20th century shoulder. Land of the unusual. Of white, walled-in cities with narrow terraced streets. Dotted with forlorn, desolate beggars. Of bazaars where you can barter for anything from fine silks to an evil eye. Land of the wandering street vendor. Hawking grilled camel liver, sticky sweets, and hot mint tea. Morocco. Land of the broiling African sun. Land of mystery. Intrigue. Up until its independence in 1956, Morocco was split into three zones. French, Spanish, and the international zone of Tangier. That's where I was sent to meet them. At my office in San Francisco, I'd received an envelope postmarked Kashmir. Inside were five $1,000 bills, an airline ticket, and a note that read, Your services required immediately. Enclosed part payment. Kindly meet us on the 23rd instant. Hotel Carthage, 14 Place Malakoff, Tangier. It was signed, Mr. Peters and Associates. It was now the 25th. I'd arrived in Tangier two days ago and checked into the hotel as directed. There was no Mr. Peters registered, nor was one expected. I waited three more days. Still no Mr. Peters. It was the 28th. I was in the Carthage bar sampling a brandy, lime, and soda. A bellhop handed me a telegram. It, too, had been sent from Kashmir. It read, Unfortunate delay, stop. Arriving tomorrow, the 29th, stop. Mr. Peters and Associates. I downed the last of the brandy and soda, winked at a cute-looking French girl sitting alone at the bar, and then retired to my room. I'd been in bed about two hours. Suddenly, the lights went on. I turned my head, looking up into the muzzle of a Webley automatic. I, sir, am Mr. Peters. Mr. Peters. Short, overly large. He wore an outdated double-breasted white suit, the kind they make up in Hong Kong for ten dollars. He wore a fez. From behind thick, black, horn-rimmed glasses popped huge brown eyes. Over by the door stood a tall, lean, good-looking man of about 55. He was decked out in a British officer's uniform, the kind they wore in India at the turn of the century. He carried a swagger stick. A black patch covered his left eye, a monocle his right. He held a pith helmet under his arm. He looked like something out of Gunga Din. So, you're Peters. Hmm? Welcome to Tangier. Uh, and if you don't mind, uh, would you remove that instrument from my face? It was a sort of test, so you passed with flying colors. I'd been unhappy to find I'd hired the services of a man who cringed at the sight of a revolver confronting him. You, sir, did not blink an eye. I like that. Then no, 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 say it again. You passed with flying colors. Would you agree to that, Jack? Flying colors, Peters, old boy. Come forward, Captain. I am Captain Jack O'Shaughnessy of Australia. I, sir, standing alone. My cup was raised, faced 50 of the demons as they came charging through the past. Aye, sir, unafraid of... Yes, 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 Captain. Mr. Slade will hear about that some other time. We've got 20 minutes to make our connection. Connection? Uh, we leave immediately for Zagora. Uh, if you'll be kind enough to dress and gather your belongings, sir... Oh, would you kindly get that gun out of my face? I wouldn't hesitate to wound you, should you not rise. Immediately, sir. If you're a member of my company and disobeyed such an order, I'd have had you horsewhipped. I tell you, Peters, in the yes, old days. Yes, 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 Captain. You go on down to the front desk and take care of Mr. Slade's account. No doubt about it. These young people need them. Is he all right? Jack? Oh, oh yes, yes. He likes to go back into the past. Now, sir, our train departs in 16 minutes. Shall we proceed?
Asking too much of you gentlemen to inform me as to where we're going. Uh, shall we begin by beginning at the beginning? And the man... If you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I, I have to... You'll find it to your left, Captain. Uh, thank you, Peter. As I was about to say, a man worth knowing is a man worth knowing. Get to the point. It's like this. We require the services of a man of strength, a man of cunning, one able to think fast, uh, take command of the situation at hand, one able to use his fist and, if necessary, a gun. We, sir, are embarking upon a most dangerous journey, one that may entail the loss of life. Whose life? Well, let us say that uh, that will depend upon you. I don't know who is more confused at this point, me or that half-witted captain. Ah, now, don't let Captain Jack hear you express that term. He can be mighty dangerous when provoked. And so, I say to you, it is I, Captain Jack. I've returned. I left Australia as a young shaver to join the Bengal Lancers. I served most of my time in the interior of India. Fighting tribesmen sworn to wipe out British rule. In 1940, I enlisted with an Australian force in the Middle East in the fight against Rommel. At the close of the war, I became a man of the world, a, a regular soldier of fortune, you might say. I served under many flags. I'm presently a dealer in artifacts. So that's how I met Peter. Yes, that was in Damascus, crossroads of the world. I was born and raised in that city of City. There I met the captain, oh, quite by accident. Uh, we were both at an auction, uh, bidding on a bronze falcon, uh, bidding against one another, each pushing the price higher and higher. The good captain whispered in my ear the splendid suggestion that we'll pool forces and purchase the falcon together. Well, uh, yes, we did. We then formed a partnership, later selling the falcon at a handsome profit. About a month ago, we were in Istanbul. The captain read of a series of valuable artifacts that had been buried in various places throughout the world by Mussolini. One item of particular interest to us was a gold medallion, a full eight inches in diameter, on good authority reported to be worth in excess of, in your currency, one million dollars. Should we find it, you will be in for a third. Then it's the medallion we're after. Correct. It bears the name Medallion Rameli Hazar, which translated means medallion of death. It carries with it a curse. Sudden and unexplainable death has befallen all who have owned it. Anyway, the medallion has passed through the hands of some 11 owners. For 30 years or so, it just disappeared altogether. It turned up in India in 1908, in Egypt in 1913, and it was purchased by Shah Agra Mahal of Persia in 1990. How'd it get out here? But during the war, it was stored for safekeeping by Mussolini. You know the exact spot? Approximate spot, yes. We extracted that information from a former Mussolini aide. Yes, we ran into the man in Istanbul a few weeks ago. During the war, he was captured in the desert by an Australian patrol and brought in for questioning. Captain Jack was the interrogating officer. He learned that the man had been sent by Mussolini and by Gora to bury a treasure. By strange coincidence, the captain spotted him in Istanbul Hotel Lobby working as a porter. He'd been hiding out in Istanbul trying to save sufficient money to get the Zagora to retrieve the medallion. They managed to get him to draw a map of the area where he buried the medallion. He was to give it to us in return for our silence about his powers and one-third interest in whatever we reclaimed from the sale of the medallion. Our cagey Italian gave us the slip. Before we'd seen his map, we found him hiding out in Sirenaga. And we confronted him with his treachery. Right then and there, we made him draw us another map and hand it over. How come he's not with you? Cap mysteriously disappeared. Where is it we're going? To a small oasis some 40 miles south of Zagora. You know, it should take us five days. Ah, I see we're arriving at Sidi Bu Afra. Shall we alight uh, and partake of breakfast? be arriving at Fez around noon. Peters was sitting beside me reading Cairo on 250 a day. The captain was sleeping. I peered through the window, watched the barren countryside pass as the train rocked its way south. The motion and the heat of the day were getting to me. I dozed. Was awakened by Peters tugging at my arm. Fez, hey, come. We must leave the train. Fez. Ancient city of beauty. We stopped barely an hour long enough to pick up equipment, hire a car, and driver. Our route led us southwest. The heat was becoming unbearable. Peter's huge frame was perspiring profusely. The captain was up front humming, waltzing Matilda. 
The heat didn't seem to disturb him in the slightest. The guide for the past hour had been driving at breakneck speed along the single lane road. A blowout. Pump the brakes, don't jam them on. We'll all be killed, Peter's own. Shut up, Jack. Shut up. Fortunate. Fortunate indeed. Rather exciting, wouldn't you say, Peter? Uh, uh. Now let's give him a hand to remove that wheel. Sindara, Sindara, kill danger. Why, get there with him for trouble. The horse. It's Sindara in his van. Assemble the machine gun. Assemble it, I am Sindara. Seek of this desert region. You have wares to trade. Why do you hide behind those guns? Sindara, friend, come forward. No harm should be done to you. I say we let go with a jolly round of fire. Keep that gun trained on them. I'm an American. These are my friends. We're traveling to Zangora. We we do not carry anything to trade. Ah, American. American very rich. You have money, jewelry. No, neither. Ah, no money. Strange how you rent car, buy food. We have a few francs, nothing that amounts to anything. I don't believe. You're talking about a lie. I search. Just mount from that horse and I'll put a bullet through you. <laughs> you give big orders to Tendara. You shoot me, my men will kill you and your friends. We have you outnumbered. You give us money, we give you your lives. Look, let's avoid trouble. You take your men and ride off. You are in no position to give order, American. I give order. I think we just kill you. Captain, give them a warning burst. We will be back, American. They take your head. We arrived at Pinifer at sundown, checked into a small hotel situated in the heart of the market area. Peters set about hiring a Senegalese porter, mules, and six Bedouin tribesmen as an escort. We were in Peters' room, charting our course. Lieutenant Valier, Administrative Service, Foreign Legion. Come in, Lieutenant. A fellow officer. I salute you, sir. And I, you, sir. And I, you, sir. Yes, 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 Captain, that's enough of that. Now, what can we do for you, sir? It has come to my attention. You intend making the trip to Sagora? It's extremely dangerous crossing for foreigners, unescorted. We'd be well advised to wait for the regular caravan. Oh, the caravan doesn't leave for another five weeks. We can't wait that long. I see. Then, gentlemen, if you insist upon making this trip, I cannot be responsible for your safety. We'll be all right, sir. I have heard that from many who have set out alone. For some, the trip was successful. And for the others? Waylaid, killed. I trust this will not be your fate. Arm yourselves well, and good luck. You will surely need it. Drive the horse for camp here. We don't want to get lost in this storm. All right, driver, we'll set up camp over here for the night. Post two guards. Bring the tents over by the tree. Now let's get out of this storm. At dinner here, an ancient walled-in city situated at the southwest base of the Atlas. We engaged a camel driver and four of his straggly dromedaries. We arrived at Zagora on the sixth day, bypassing the town to camp at the deserted legion post ten miles to the south. The fort looked like something out of Beaugest. A faded and ripped tricolor flew from the lookout tower. I half expected to be greeted by an assistant director from Paramount. After all, every single he's unpacked the equipment will seek suitable quarters and follow with our personal belongings. Hey, tell us here about. You can close those gates and post a couple of your men on watch. Now, this looks like the officer's barracks. Now, this will be all right. At dawn, sir. Let's lose no time to seek out our little... <laughs> dingus, the medallion Romeli has our... Abdul! Say there, say there. Yes, the fat boss. What are all these people doing here and these animals? Uh, Berbers, the fat boss. Berbers? Where did they come from? From Africa, fat boss. They have lived here many centuries. Yeah, I know that, you fool. I mean, where did this bunch come from and who let them in? They come during the night. From where, I do not know. How dare you let strange people into the fort without my approval? Oh, mother, a thousand apologies. Abdul, I not want to disturb you, fat boss. Now, will you stop calling me fat boss? Yes, boss. No, get that goat away from me. Look, it's trying to eat my shoe. Tala, tala, bad goat. Now, what's all the commotion, Peter? Well, oh, Abdul, let this wandering tribe in here. Could be mighty dangerous. Good morning, dear friends. Isn't it a glorious morning? Oh, no, shut up, Jack. Let's get on our way. Another couple of hours and that sun will be broiling us alive. Do you have the map, Captain, or has the goat eaten it? Under my gun belt. Abdul, will take uh, three tribesmen with us and the Senegalese porter. The others will remain. Oh, sorry, I got him okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. You betcha. All right, let's mount up. We 
We crossed the Moroccan frontier into Algeria. We were now 20 miles or so south of the fort and well into the Sahara. The mid-morning sun was firing off its burning rays. Sudden stabs of pain made me double up. I felt feverish. The hot red rays of the sun blinded my vision. The sand began to ripple and then roar like a huge surf. And that was the last thing I seemed to remember. I was slowly brought to consciousness by the sound of someone digging. I was in a small oasis. Abdul and the three tribesmen were stretched out beside their camel, sleeping. Peters and Jack were by the water hole studying the map. The Senegalese was waist deep in a hole shoveling out sand. I rose and stumbled toward them. Slay, good to see you up and about. Doesn't look as though you're having much luck. Well, I can't understand it unless the Italian tricked us again. Peters, he's uncovered something. A small chest. The caution, man. Easy with it. Easy. Ah, you give it to me. Uh, go on. Now, you join the others. It, it, it's locked, Peter. Yeah, force it open with this. Uh, uh, remove the paddy. Yeah. By Joe, Peter. We've got it. A veritable fortune lies in our hands, and by right of possession, it's all ours. Think of it, man. We are holding in excess of a million dollars. Top it off, boy. Top it. Mm, a rare specimen. A beauty, indeed. And it's all mine. Ours, Peter. Hmm? Ours. Oh, yes, Captain, how right you are. Ours. <laughs> you say it's solid gold? Oh, solid gold, through and through. Uh, let's return to the fort. I don't want to spend another night out here. Uh, Abdul, get up, you lazy blighter. Get everything packed. We're moving out. The medallion looked impressive and real, but something bothered me about it, something I couldn't pinpoint. It was dusk when we arrived back at the fort. Thin columns of smoke from the Berber campfires rose and trailed off into the night. Papa, Papa, now, Papa, what's Papa, he shouting about? Postman come, Tendara, Tendara. Close the gates. Captain, get that machine gun out here. Abdul, can we count on the Berbers? Yes, boss. We'll fight. Line them up around the wall and have the Bedouins cover the gate. Yes, yes. Tendara, Tendara. Out the gun over here, Captain. Here they come. Uh, about a hundred of them. Come on, you demon. Look at the run. <laughs> come back, you cowards. Hold your fire. Abdul, tell the Berbers to hold their fire. Oh. They're regrouping. There they come. Oh, you've got them. I don't think they'll trouble us anymore tonight. Now, Captain, you take over. I'm going down to get some sleep. Now, you'd better stay with them, Peters. Wake me at dawn, and I suggest you leave the medallion with me. It'll be safer in our quarters. Uh, safer with me along. Yeah, as you wish. Peters wasn't about to trust anyone with his prized medallion. He had it out the moment we reached our quarters. Feel the sheer wealth. Doesn't it give you the strangest feeling to hold a million dollars in your hands? Here. Touch it. Ah, be careful. Hold on to it, man. Oh, oh I can see it. It was too much for you. Uh, pass it back to me. Let's put it away for safekeeping. The effects of sunstroke were still with me. The moment I hit the sack, I was out. I slept a full 24 hours. I was awakened by Peters tugging at my arm. Wake up, man. Wake up. Uh, what is it? What is uh, it? The captain and I have come to say goodbye. Goodbye? What do you mean, goodbye? Where are you going? The arrangements were made in Tangier for a small plane to pick us up on the 12th. That's today. Uh, the plane seats only four. And through an oversight, I failed to mention that there would be three people to take out. Uh, the pilot brought along his wife. And, well, uh, understandably, he refuses to leave her behind. One of us must stay. You can't leave me here. Oh, have to, sir. I must. I'm leaving you an additional $5,000 to cover any necessary expenses you may incur along the way. Oh. Abdul will see you back to Penny Furs. You can take a car to Fez and the train to Tangier. As promised, uh, when we sell the medallion, one third will be sent to you. I've enjoyed having you along. You're a man after my own heart. It's been fun. <laughs> yes, yes, fun. Well, say my hand. And thank you, sir, for everything. Good luck, old boy. You've been a jolly good sport about it all. Goodbye, gentlemen. Abdul. Yes, boss. You wouldn't happen to have a camel going to Tangier, would you? Twenty mad boss. Tribesmen leave after fat boss pay them off. They steal my camels. Leave me one donkey. Yes, that's what I thought. Well, we can take turns at riding. <laughs> you pretty funny, boss. Don't have donkeys. Stolen by Berber. Oh, no. Well, it's only a ten-mile walk to Zagora. Come on, I'll buy you a drink. Line San Francisco. Today I got in from Tangier exactly two months following that fateful day I received a telegram from Kashmir. 
If I ever run into those two angels, well, that's the way they'll end up. Angels. Oh, I nearly forgot. Uh, the medallion. It was a fake. When I accidentally on purpose dropped it, a fine crack appeared. I've been told solid gold doesn't do that sort of thing. I wonder how Peters and Jack reacted when they found out. If you happen by my office and see a sign that reads, Don't call me, I'll call you. I know you'll understand. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.